you. <clears throat> I have no disclosures. Well, believe it or not, from a historical standpoint, the first successful esophageal reconstruction was performed using a coal interposition in Germany over a century ago. But uh, surgeons quickly figured out that the uh, stomach was an easier, safer, quicker conduit. So the uh, uh, colon, while still important, pretty much became a secondary conduit option, at least for most of us. So what I'd like to do uh, this morning is first review standard colon interposition and then switch gears and share some of the techniques we've been using over the last 10 years. The uh, vascular anatomy of the colon is variable. All three arteries, the right, the middle, and the left are present in about 70% of cases, which means in about 30%, these arteries are either multiple or absent. The most important thing to know is the marginal artery is either absent or atretic in about 5% of cases, and that's usually in the mid-right, but occasionally the splenic uh, flexure distribution, which can uh, obviously lead to disastrous results during colon interposition. All of these really underscore the need for good intraoperative vascular assessment. I think it's fair to say that most surgeons prefer using a isoperistaltic left colon interposition based on the ascending branch of the uh, inferior mesenteric artery. About 70% of reported cases are done using the left colon and, and reasons cited include a more reliable marginal artery and a better diameter match with the esophagus. During mobilization, usually a branch of the middle colic and occasionally an accessory left colic uh, artery need to be ligated and divided. There are certainly surgeons that prefer using an isoperistaltic right colon interposition based on the middle colic vessels. During mobilization, usually right colic and iliocolic artery and veins need to be ligated and divided. The reasons cited to use a right colon include it's easier to mobilize, there's an easier distal colon reconstruction with an iliotransverse colostomy, and even left colon enthusiasts might find the transverse colon based on the middle colic uh, vessels preferable, easier for short segment esophageal reconstruction below the carina. But uh, arguably, the optimal conduit for these short segment reconstructions is the jejunum, and that'll be the topic of the next talk. So what I'd really like to focus on is long segment esophageal reconstruction from the abdomen to the neck. Uh, there's not only two options with respect to which colon to use, but there's also two choices uh, regarding how to route these long segment colon interpositions either orthotopically through the posterior mediastinum, which some believe lead to better function, um, or retrosternally through the anterior mediastinum, which is obviously the only option for late reconstruction after remote esophagectomy for perforations, leaks, and so forth. After you remove the sternoclavicular joint, the anastomosis can usually be done at the level of the first intercostal space, which saves about three to five centimeters of conduit length and may help reduce the ischemia of a longer conduit tip. It allows more control over the orientation of the vascular pedicle and conduit, minimizing the risk of redundancy or tension, and both of these are critical for a successful outcome. If an anastomotic leak occurs, it's usually subcutaneous versus deep neck or mediastinal, and finally the retrosternal uh, route, as we just heard, facilitates supercharging. Most of these cases can be anticipated preoperatively. The evaluation preparation is very simple. Three items, colonoscopy, CT angiogram to rule out large vessel disease, and some form of a bowel preparation. These are the basic steps, a standard colon uh, interposition. Most of you know these, and I'll uh, demonstrate these in a minute. But as a brief review, you start by mobilizing both right and left colons, amputate the omentum, the most critical aspect is intraoperative vascular assessment. That begins with transillumination of both left and right colon mesenteries to get an initial idea of which colon would be best. Use an umbilical tape to measure the gap that needs to be bridged and then temporarily mark the proximal and distal colon cuts. Use a, a, a bulldog clamps to test occlude vessels, which might be ligated with Doppler assessment of the marginal artery. And typically, after applying these uh, uh, bulldog clamps, the Doppler signal 
is uh, diminished but remains present, and that usually signifies that that colon is okay to use. If the Doppler signal goes absent uh, and or that colon appears cyanotic, the other colon needs to be assessed. And finally, you divide the colon, divide the vessels, uh, pass the conduit into the neck based on its pedicle, do the proximal, then distal uh, abdominal anastomoses. When you do a literature search for standard colon interposition, I guess it should come as no surprise that many of the authors, co-authors of these dozen or so key references are fellow club members. These are a, a bit of a mixed bag with right and left colons, long and short uh, segment interpositions, which may impact outcome. But as you can see, average mortality in these series is 8%, graft necrosis 4%, in an astomotic leak 12%. Not bad, a little bit worse than what's published for stomach conduits, but really not bad. The biggest disparity between colon and stomach conduits come when you look at long-term complications, and these are publications that specifically looked at long-term complications of standard colon interposition. As you can see, average conduit redundancy in these series, 11%. Anastomotic stenosis, 18%, and reoperation, uh, 20%. These are a bit of a mixed bag, too, with varying lengths of follow up. And uh, I think it's uh, fair to say that as follow up lengthens, these statistics are only going to get worse, particularly redundancy and uh, reoperation, which is just not seen in stomach conduits, at least not to this degree. So I'd uh, like to uh, uh, discuss supercharged long segment uh, colon interpositions. I'll show a case that we recently performed next. But as a brief introduction, intraoperative vascular assessment is done the exact same way you would do as for standard colon interposition. Colon mobilization is done the exact same way you would do for uh, standard colon interposition. With a minor exception, if we're using the left colon, we'll ligate and divide the middle colic arteries near the root of the mesentery to preserve length so these vessels can be reimplanted in the thoracic inlet. And the same goes for the iliocolic uh, artery and vein if we're using the right colon. This is a 63-year-old uh, female that presented to us a year earlier in shock with a perforated stomach due to an incarcerated peritophageal hernia. She underwent um, uh, 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 emergency subtotal gastrectomy, esophagectomy, uh, spit fistula. She um, recovered and represented for reconstruction, but we didn't have enough stomach to uh, bridge the gap. After she was anesthetized, we took that opportunity to dilate her proximal esophagus with serial uh, savory dilators. Uh, the picture on the right, she's prepped and draped with our planned cervical mediastinal and redo laparotomy incisions. Start with the laparotomy, mobilize both right and left colons, transilluminate both colon mesenteries. You can see the right colon had three independent right colic vessels, all of which would have to be ligated and divided along with the iliocolic if we were to use the right colon. The uh, left colon appeared to have a nice ascending branch off the IMA and a good marginal artery, so we thought that the uh, left colon would probably be preferable. transverse colon here, left colon here. This patient had a bifurcated middle colic, which is uh, very common. This is the left branch of the middle colic, right branch of the middle colic. After doing our measurements, we determined that the uh, transverse colon would be cut pretty much right in between those two vessels. So put a bulldog clamp on the left branch of the uh, middle colic artery. There was also a small accessory uh, left colic branch that would need to be ligated and divided, so we put a a, a bulldog clamp on that. Doppler assessment, the Doppler signal diminished but remained present, so we thought the left colon would be a go. We took uh, the bulldog clamps off of those vessels, then went up into the neck. Made our hockey stick incision, mobilized a, a flap of pectoralis major, took the sternoclavicular joint out, ligated and divided both the internal mammary vein and artery right over the top of the uh, second rib, regionally heparinized both of these vessels with initial flush of heparin, followed by dilute papaverin and a final uh, injection of heparin, then put small clips on the end. <clears throat> Went to the abdomen, made our colon cuts, made our mesentery cuts, again ligated and divided the middle colic vessels near the root of the mesentery to preserve length, 
and regionally heparinized both of those vessels with heparin, dilupapavir, and heparin, just like we did the internal mammary vessels up in the neck. Make a generous substernal tunnel, pull the uh, uh, conduit up into the, the uh, tip and the thoracic inlet. No redundancy, no tension on that conduit. We put a couple tacking sutures on the tip of the conduit to temporarily reflect it downwards to expose the vessels. Our microvascular surgeons wheel their microscope in to perform the anastomoses. They usually start with the venous anastomosis first. They have a nice coupler system that's easy, quick, everts the wall of the vein nicely with high patency rates. Then do the arterial anastomosis uh, with interrupted suture. This is a quick video of the supercharged vessels after clamp release, internal mammary artery, anastomosis, middle colic artery there, excellent Doppler flow through these vessels. Unfortunately, the internal mammary vein was not usable in this case, so they plugged the middle colic vein directly into the left anominate vein. You can see their plastic uh, a coupler there and good flow through that vessel as well. So anytime you think you have a new novel procedure, you might want to dig deep into the literature and, and figure out it's not so new or novel, and this was just mentioned in the last talk, uh, publication in the journal Surgery over 70 years ago by Dr. William uh, Longmire described a uh, few cases of supercharged jejunum. I'd just like to read the passage out of this uh, 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 manuscript. Immediately upon release of the bulldog clamps, pulsations which had previously been absent were seen in the small terminal intestinal arteries at the end of the intestinal loop. And the appearance of this portion of the loop, which had been cyanotic, returned to normal, and the bowel responded with normal peristaltic uh, contractions. Well. Uh, while largely abandoned over the next several decades uh, uh, due to the lack of reliability of microvascular anastomosis, what Dr. Longmire describes here is what we see after we release the clamps from these supercharged vessels. The uh, tip of the conduit, which is a little bit pale, pinks up. We start to see some early peristalsis, and this can't be a bad thing. We line up the esophagus over the anterior row of the tinea, four tacking sutures, two to three centimeters apart, partially uh, transect the esophagus, put a little rent in the colon, use a 45 millimeter endo GIA to create an initial side-to-side -side communication between the esophagus and the uh, colon, like a collared type of anastomosis. Take the tip of the esophagus off. Close the open common lumen with a single layer of vicral sutures, put a soft tissue drain behind the anastomosis, Rotate the pec flap and tack that to the edges of the uh, bony thoracic uh, inlet uh, defect with interrupted absorbable sutures, a second soft tissue drain between the pec flap and the skin. We then go to the abdomen for the distal upper GI tract uh, reconstruction. We found that the neck or the waist of the antrum is a pretty good diameter match to these colon conduits. So shave the uh, stomach back to the uh, uh, neck of the uh, antrum, do a coker maneuver, wide pyloroplasty. At that point, we had a little extra colon, so we shaved that back for two to three centimeters to give it a direct shot into that stomach remnant. Did an end-to-end, -end, two-layer hand-sewn anastomosis. You can see the posterior layer here. We're just about ready to do the uh, anterior layer there. Once we get that done, we'll do the colon reconstruction. We did an end-to-end, hand-sewn, two-layer anastomosis, feeding J-tube, and we're done. Closed cervical mediastinal incision, closed redo laparotomy, feeding J-tube, and two uh, soft tissue drains in the uh, thoracic inlet. So we go very slow with these patients post-op. We put their NG tube to intermittent suction. We start trickle J-tube feedings no sooner than two to three days post-op and only advance the J-tube drainings when they have good uh, bowel function. We delay contrast study for 10 days and after that time start clear liquids and then discharge the patient on a full liquid diet with supplemental J-tube feedings. We see them back in clinic in a month and uh, if they're doing well, start to adma advance more to a regular diet remove their J-tube when they're taking adequate uh, calories by mouth. This is a contrast study on this patient 10 days post-op. You can see free flow of contrast through the cervical esophagus, colon conduit, stomach remnant, and right out into the uh, small bowel. 
In fact, the uh, radiologists that did this study spontaneously commented there was pretty good motility to the uh, colon conduit, and that corresponded to what the uh, patient subjectively told us in a month that she was swallowing well, actually taking adequate calories by mouth when we saw her in a month and uh, uh, requested her J2 be removed, which we did. So these are the published series with supercharged uh, colon interposition. Obviously not many patients, no long-term follow-up. You'll also note that the left and right colon numbers are reversed to what they are for standard colon interposition, and this is probably due to the fact that the ileocolic vessels on average are a one to two millimeter larger diameter, may need, may <clears throat> need uh, be easier to reimplant than the middle colic using the uh, left colon. We've also added our IU data here, we basically have doubled our experience since our publication in Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 2012, having done now some 20-odd uh, uh, cases over 10 years. You can do the math. That's uh, only about two per year. So we don't see those cases, at least at our institution, that often. But, but as you can see, average mortality in these series, 3%, graft necrosis, 0%, anastomotic leak, uh, 10%, uh, not bad, particularly considering all these are long segment colon interpositions. So in summary, standard colon uh, interposition is technically more challenging with longer operating times and stomach conduit. The short term uh, risk are higher with average published mortality for colon conduits, 8%, which appears to be about a two-fold increase over published mortality of stomach conduits with STS data. But again, uh, the most striking uh, difference between colon and stomach comes where you look at long-term complications with standard colon interposition with conduit redundancy, stricture reoperation averaging 11, 18, and 20 percent respectively in uh, published series. Well, it can be called by many terms, for perhaps vascular augmentation is a more proper term, but supercharging really represents a, an attempt to reestablish native dual vascularity to a long segment colon interposition. It adds little time, collectively about an hour, considering vessel preparation and microvascular anastomoses, and gives the thoracic team a bit of a break in an otherwise uh, long day. If the supercharged vessels occlude, you're pretty much left with a standard uh, colon interposition, which may heal on its own. So uh, uh, perhaps there's a bit of a fail-safe safe technique in that regard as compared to supercharged jejunum, which tend to be more reliant on the supercharged vessels. And finally, will supercharge reduce perioperative morbidity and mortality, improve quality of life by reducing strictures, improving motility, reduce late conduit redundancy or dilatation that uh, can wind up uh, requiring reoperation. We do believe that uh, ischemia plays a not insignificant role in many of these complications, so supercharging uh, has potential to, to improve on these outcomes, but uh, we obviously need further study to answer these questions. That's it. Thank you.